morning and welcome to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Today, we're going to be talking about writing with author extraordinaire, Deepam Susan Wads. Now, Susan is an author, a writer, a facilitator, and she facilitates writing workshops. Um, Good morning, Susan. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us again on Fresh Waves. Um, You have two names, Deepam and Susan. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Um, In uh, 1983, I... uh, became a disciple of um, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, who later became Osho. And um, the name Deepam means light. Uh, my full name is Ma'anurag Deepam, which is love light. And um, that uh, really resonates with me. So I kept that name. I've kept that name because it reminds me of, of the path of waking up that's been so important to me all these years. That's lovely. So when you write, do you write under the name of Deepam or the name of Susan? Yeah, I write under both names. I'm trying more to steer towards the Susan because I think it uh, reflects who I am to the general public in a more clear way. Uh, Deepam is an Indian name, so um, I just want to make sure that people understand that I'm not trying to uh, appropriate or or be um, something else. Um, But you will find that quite a few of my pieces are published under DPOM, but I'm really trying to move towards the the Susan. So you'll see, actually, in all of my submissions, you've got this Susan bracket to DPOM wad, just so um, so it's clear. Hmm. It's mud. (laughs) Clear as mud. (laughs) Well, lots of people have a second name, a middle name, a third name, a fourth name. Who knows? So it's, it's not that unusual to have two names. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> okay so people have asked me before why do you say that they're a writer and an author isn't it the same thing and it's it's not the same thing is it um i'm no expert in that regard um but i would assume that everyone who writes is a writer which is um a foundation of the amherst writers and artists method of writing facilitation which i'm a facilitator um states very clearly in 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 their um in their offerings that anyone who writes is a writer. Um, but an author, I would presume, is someone who's been published. Mm-hmm. That's my understanding of it I as well. That's, yeah, that's the distinction, I would say. Mm-hmm. So how did you start, how did you become a writer? Uh, well, I've, I've been writing since I was a, a young teenager. And, um, and um, how did I start? I just started because, you know, I think actually, I think what really got me going was actually Leonard Cohen, reading mm. his poems and uh, his novels, his crazy novels. Um, if, I, if I think back to, you know, 14, 15 years old, I think that's what I want. I want to do that. Mm. <laughs> so I want to do that. Of course, I still haven't come anywhere close, but, you know, one can, one can keep trying. Well, I think that's a matter of opinion. I find your writing to be absolutely beautiful. I have not read your writing on paper. When I talk about your writing, it's because I hear you speak during our workshops and you read what you have written. And part of that is your voice and the way you read the piece. But it's beautiful. I love your writing. Thank you so much. Now, you started when you were a teenager. Do you think that there was... um, did you have good teachers through high school that would have said, you know, this is really nice. Let's pursue this. <laughs> Cause a uh, lot of no. people write when they're teenagers, they write their diaries, they write their angst, they get their feelings onto paper and rip it up and throw in the garbage. And yeah, it's very sure cathartic. I <laughs> for sure. I did that. But um, I, no, I, I didn't tend to throw stuff out. Cause I, I had this weird belief that everything I wrote was gold. <laughs> 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 Which is really quite hilarious when you think about it. Um, in grade six, my teacher, Patricia Potty, um, I remember her rolling up the, um, you know, the map that went down over the blackboard. And she had uh, written in chalk a story that I wrote. And I was reading it on the blackboard and thinking, huh, and then suddenly realizing it was mine. <laughs> oh. So that was pretty exciting. Um, but then, of course, uh, what happened 
which often will happen with teachers, even from that young age, you know, how to make it better. How can we change it? How can we... Anyway, but I, I still thought, well, that's pretty cool. But that wasn't... I don't know. I just... Yeah, I guess I started writing even earlier than that. Um, but no, I didn't... Uh, I didn't really have, like, a mentor uh, young. I just... I just... I was pretty arrogant. I thought I could do it on my own. I, I quit... School. I quit high school in grade eleven <laughs> to write. I oh didn't have anything to write about at that age, but anyway, I did. I hand wrote a novel. <laughs> oh my goodness! To, what uh, did your parents say about that? Not much. My parents were. <laughs> I think my parents were tired of raising children by the time I came along. <laughs> like, and and here, get this. When I was, um, I guess I I was sixteen, and uh, yeah, it was the summer I turned seventeen. I was supposed to go, uh, I had been to Quebec City on a student exchange the year before and really loved it. And I wanted to go back. So my parents had arranged for me to be an au pair for some friend of my father's. But um, that that actually tanked and they ended up saying they didn't need me. They were going to their cottage for the summer. But I convinced, get this, I'm 16. And they allowed me to take a train on my own to Quebec City and rent a, a a pension, like a little pension room in old Quebec by myself. It was six dollars a night. And uh, that's where I wrote my novel in Quebec City by myself <laughs> at 16. It just stunned me when I think about it now. It was normal then. But um, yeah. Wow. That was horrible. I mean, there's no, there's no vestiges of that novel that exists, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's the first novel, like the, what do they call it? The first crappy draft or the first shitty draft and you throw oh, yeah. that in the garbage and then, then you move on from there. So instead of maybe the first few pages, you just wrote a whole book that you threw in the garbage, but it gave you the gateway to be able to, to write the way you do today. And that is quite possible. I couldn't tell you because I don't remember much except for the protagonist's name and her wicked cousin that came up from America. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh so um, what have you done recently? I mean, I, I hear there's a novel. Uh, yeah, well, um, the first novel that I wrote, which I finished in 2015, um, which is called um, What the Living Do, um, has <laughs> it's been around? Um, I had an agent for it, a New York agent. A few it was fin- t- finished in 2015, um, and almost right away I got an agent in New York, and that was pretty heady. Uh, but after a year, she couldn't sell it and didn't know any Canadian publishers, so that that was that was done. So we parted ways, and it's been around to various agents and. And a couple of publishers that thought that it was, wanted to read it, read the whole thing, and then in the end said, mm, no, not quite so much. So, <laughs> so it's been, what, six years of doing the rounds. But uh, right now, um, it is in the hands of Regal House Publishing in the U.S. that quite like it. And um, on October 15th, it's going to uh, be put forward in their uh, fall acquisitions meeting. So I thought my wow. that. Yeah. All right. So let's that's back the, up and say you you sat down, you wrote a novel. What what inspired you to write that novel? That novel. Well, um, yeah, I've been taking a lot of uh, Sue Reynolds' a novel approach. Uh, I think we've interviewed her a few times, mm-hmm. and um, th- that that process really helped me, you know, believe that I could do that. This isn't the first one I wrote with her. But I uh, definitely wrote many, many, many of the scenes in her um, her sanctuary workshop. So there were lots of you're asking, you know, kind of what the inspiration for the the actual book was. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I'm trying to remember the exact moment that I was like, I'm going to write this. Uh, I don't think it started out to be a novel, but um, one of the things was just just an image, what uh, Sherry Coleman calls um, a sacred image. And it was uh, a woman uh, on a uh, road crew, like, a, you know, holding a sign kind of thing. And I thought, okay, you know, what if she, what if, which is always a great way to start any kind of story, what if she wasn't just the sign holder, but she was actually part of the road crew? 
And so that was my character. Um, mm. Fairly attractive, late 30s um, woman working with men. So that was that. But then um, the, the first scene I remember happening actually was inspired by things that have happened in my life, which was um, having um, cervical cancer and then finding out just before, you know, having supposed to be having a hysterectomy, finding out that I was pregnant. So I thought, okay, well, that's, that's a pretty good conflict for a book. Mm-hmm. But let's see what we can do with that. So it's not my story, but that situation is definitely um, pivotal in in this in this story. Wow! So had you written a well, you you wrote that high school first novel before this book. Had you written other novels before this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The the first one I wrote in um, in Sue Reynolds' novel approach year long process to get the first draft of your novel written um and it was uh and and actually what's what's interesting about that is uh, again it was based on something that had happened in my life but I was writing about it and it was really close to what had happened like close in time um so then I met I met a man who had kind of the opposite story and I thought Oh, I'll write about that story is really interesting because mine was too close. Mm-hmm. So I, I I wrote this whole novel written from a man's point of view about um, having his uh, child taken away from him uh, for no good reason, quote unquote, because it really was no good reason. Um, and him trying to get her back. Uh, and this particular man had um, the, the the real guy <laughs> had uh, his his wife had wanted to have an abortion and he convinced her not to. And then um, when she had the baby, she was in the process actually of giving it up for adoption. He came into the room when the worker was there and she was signing the papers over and he came in and said, wait a minute, hold on. It was a premature baby as well. Mm. So he took the baby and raised her until she was two. And, and then the woman came along and said, well, I, I, you know, let's do, let's do shared custody and I'm going to, you know, give her the best education, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually she completely estranged the child from him. So when I met him, he was in the process of, of trying to get his daughter back into his life. And I thought, well, that's good. Let's write about that. (laughs) <laughs> so that was the first novel that was all written from his point of view and now I'm taking a secondary character um, that was in that novel named Kitty and I'm I'm rewriting the entire story and that guy is just like a paragraph <laughs> he, oh. he's somebody that she meets along the way <laughs> oh isn't so, that yeah. funny it's funny how it evolves and organically sprouts branches and leaves and <laughs> t- yeah. turns into something completely different. Yeah, because this is now like 11 years later. So I am I have much more of a, a perspective on it. One of my teachers, Barbara Turner Vesalago, um, she talks about composting things that events that happen, especially traumatic events that happen in your life. So that instead of writing a rant, you, um, you write something with a little bit of perspective and distance. And I think it's, I think it's a really good, really good advice to to wait. Um, You know, you can definitely journal and stuff, but if you want to write something serious, you need to wait. (laughs) But some of us who've written with her are um, getting a little older and they say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to live that long. (laughs) (laughs) The waiting is over. The time is now. (laughs) I don't want to wait 10 years because I'm not quite sure, you know, I'm going to be able to remember. (laughs) Yeah. But and the perspective is different in 10 years than it is in two years than it is in two months. Exactly. Okay, so you've written how many novels now? Um, three and one memoir. Wow. How long does it take to write a novel for you? <laughs> well, this one that I'm working on, when you think of it, it's uh, 11 years. Um, yeah, I don't know, two, like to finish it? Like yeah, two to three years for me. Anyway, I think you know some people. Depending on what they're writing, I write literary fiction. If uh, 
um, I don't know, people who have a, a template like romance writers and, and so on. Um, I think that those people, you know, they can bang out a novel in a few months, but that's unfortunately not me. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. That'd be great. I'd love to do that, but not my process. It's not your process, not your style. And I think that becomes very evident in certain writings. I, a lot of authors, I know people have said, oh, you've got to read whatever author, and, you know, I'm on book 13. And mm-hmm. I have read the first book, which isn't even part of the series, and liked it far better than any of the other books that came after. Mm. <laughs> but the formula does work because it really does sell. And I guess that's what the next question leads to. Are you writing to publish a book something that you want sold or are you writing to just write the best book you can possibly write uh i think probably the latter is is closer to the truth um because absolutely i want to get published but i if i was writing to get published i would write something different (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) i would write differently um you know my, my stories are mostly character like they are character driven my plot is something that i have to really work on to to make an arc um, because I'm much more interested in the psychology and, you know, the depth of, of character. So, um, yeah, I, just, I, I write because I'm uh, one author that I'm writing to find out what I know, you know, and I think that's often the case when I'm writing. Isn't so, that interesting? I'm writing to find out what I know. Wow. <laughs> that's quite the <laughs> statement, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I'm a, an expressive arts practitioner, so I look at that and think, wow, that's really profound. That's yeah. part of the process, right, is getting what you know onto the page, and sometimes it's surprising what we know. Absolutely. Really surprising. I'm, yeah. <laughs> so do you find yourself a people watcher then in your in your day-to-day life? If, if your, your books are character-driven, you have to mm-hmm. know a lot about the characters of human beings then. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say watch. I would say listener. I, you know, m- for the last thirty plus years, I've been a uh, body worker, um, uh, therapeutic body worker. So I have people in probably the most vulnerable position one can be. I you know they're essentially naked on the table. I mean, they're covered, but you know, and they're they. So what happens is um, they share stuff with me. They tell me about their lives, and um, that. You know, I understand people from just listening. Um, mm. I, yeah, and I guess it's, I absorb as opposed to listen. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not listening to your story so that I can use it. Let's just say that. <laughs> right. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just absorbing human nature, if you will, just by listening and and being with people. So yeah. w- when you say a body worker, you're you're like a massage therapist or something yeah um i i studied in india i'm an osho rebalancer it's a synthesis of many different techniques but a lot of it is intuitive it it, it's very hands-on don't get me wrong we do the swedish massage the deep tissue uh traeger which is that lovely rocking um therapy um but a lot of it is intuitive and a lot of it has to do with emotional release work because I studied that as well. Breath, using the breath uh, to bring up, you know, buried emotions and emotions that need to surface. That need to surface and come out. Yeah. Be set free, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds really interesting. And I know what you mean. You're not, you're not, asking people their stories half the time people just lie on that table and they just start spilling because <laughs> the massage itself works out these things that they'd like to talk about. I actually had a massage therapist once who started telling me her story. <laughs> so I don't know what what reverse osmosis happened there, but well, people do they they that's what happens. They want to know who you are as well. So I mean, I don't know if what your massage therapist was up to, but you know, people most of my clients are like, you know, so what what's new in your life and um and often just sharing a little bit about me helps them open up as well. Yeah. They would give them that confidence that if you can speak freely, then they can as well. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. 
So you're a busy person if you're doing all of this and you're writing at the same time. No wonder that one book is 11 years in the making. <laughs> <laughs> and on top of that, you throw in a memoir course. <laughs> So do, can you can you actually in one week do the two different types of writing, write memoir and then switch back and work on your novel? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, because I do so many workshops in a week. I, I lead um, right now. It's all on Zoom, but I lead as many as five workshops a week. Plus, I take the one with you where where we're, we're writing to prompts. Um, and my Friday evening group is a, is a, a long, a long suffering group. Uh, it's the same group of six, seven of us that have been writing together for some time and they, and they're all working. We are all working on long projects. Um, and that, so that's all novel that, that I have to write to the novel with that one. But with the prompted writing, it could be anything. It could be, you know, a story from my life or it could be a new short story. So yes, definitely we can, I can switch around. But I, I, when I'm really serious about my novel, I, I need dedicated time uh, to do that. Like when I'm actually when I'm trying to put it together, <laughs> when I'm trying to take all the bits and pieces and put it together. I need I need to concentrate on that and nothing else for a while. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to take our first break, and when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about your novel that you're. Um, not working on it's finished and mm -hmm. you're going to tell us a little bit about the novel what the story's about and um the process going forward we're talking this morning with Deepam susan wads i'm your host bren masson and this is fresh waves we'll be right back stay tuned You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Remember, if you'd like to hear this show again, you can go to freshwaves.ca or you can check out our YouTube channel at Fresh Waves Radio, capital F, capital R for radio. Now let's get back to the show. We're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson, and today we're speaking with Deepam Susan Wads, or Susan Deepam Wads. Um, Susan, you're an author, you're a writer, you're a facilitator, and we'd like to talk to you now about your novel, the one that is actually with a publisher. So let's start at the beginning. You finish your novel, and you say, oh, I have this book. Tell us a little bit about what that book's about. Well, um, you know, the elevator pitch is after Brett Catlin, a 37-year-old roads worker, is diagnosed with cancer, she must choose between the risks of giving birth or the surgery which will terminate the pregnancy. Mm. So that's the encapsulated version. Wow. Um, so she, her backstory is that uh, when she was 11, um, there was a house fire and her father and her baby sister died and she feels responsible for that. So that's what she's carrying through her life. And um, so in a way, when she gets the cancer, she feels um, that it's payback, that she should just die. Um, she has a younger lover. She's 39, I think, and, or 37 and he's 27. And of course, he doesn't want her to die. <laughs> so there's that relationship in there. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of the story. There's another backstory, too. There's another thread that runs through it, and that is that after um, her father and sister died, her mother kind of went AWOL as well. And they moved in with her aunt, Who's, who's a great character. She's one of my favorite characters in the, in the book. And um, she is left in the care of her, aunt, her cousin, who's much older in college. And he grooms her. And they have a sexual relationship, which she believes is love. And once she begins to uh, menstruate, he ditches her. And her heart is broken. So she's also carrying that with her. Hmm. Wow. That sounds like quite the story. 
I think so. I was told it didn't have enough tension, and I thought, I don't know how to put any more tension in there. <laughs> okay, so when you finished it, and I'm sure that's also a difficult conclusion. I mean, you, you finish the book and then you think, oh, well, I could fix this. I could fix that. You go back and you do your millions and millions of self-editing. Um, when did you know it was finished? <laughs> like it, was just a, it came to a point where you just said, okay, this is it. I like it. Yeah, I think so. I don't, there wasn't like a moment. Um, yeah. And I, and I have gone back even, um, Sue Reynolds was generous enough to uh, print me some advanced reading copies once I, I came to that place that I felt it was finished. Um, so I have some beautiful copies of that. And then I went through at that and started making some edits. So when I did submit it to the last publishing houses that I submitted to, it was, it was once again edited several years later, but not, not, not hugely, just little things that, jumped out at me so I don't know I can't really I can't really say there was a moment but it's finished and then did you look for an agent after that yes I had uh, I had submitted it to um, some Canadian agent that I really admire and had actually met because when I was the speaker coordinator at the Simcoe County Writers I had uh, made some great connections with with people in the industry. So that was really lovely to be able to write personally to um, like Hillary Hillary McMahon, who is just wonderful. Um, But they didn't, uh, they didn't bite. Um, They didn't bite. So I, it was funny because I, then I, I signed up to a thing called writer's relief where you put all your details in, you pay for it. And then they, send you all these agents that are possible to send it to. So I, I was on a retreat uh, on Pili Island and, um, and working like a, a 10 day writing retreat. And I finished it all up. I changed all the quotation marks from straight quotes to, or smart quotes to whatever the other ones are, because I was advised that that was, that was nicer. Um, and then I sent it out to, I think, Oh, like 60 different agents and I was sitting at dinner with Sue Reynolds and um, I got a I got a request and that was the agent that I that I went with so that was that was what I did I just sent it off immediately <laughs> mm. which I tend to do I tend to I tend to send things off sometimes a little prematurely as my father would say you tend to go off half cocked <laughs> uh, I, I I've been told I do the same thing I've been told First think, then speak. Hmm. Okay. All right. So you send it to an agent. The agent either accepts it or denies it. What about this this Hollywood, I will say, impression of people sending their book out to a million different publishers? Is that a fallacy nowadays? Uh, no, I think you have to do that. I, yeah. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm, this is not the. This is not the final. Um, yeah. So, but but because because the turnaround time is usually quite long, the reading times vary. Um, most publishers understand that you can't just sit around one by one by one and wait. I don't know about hundreds, but you know there aren't that many. But um, yeah, you you definitely multiple submissions. Absolutely. I mean, I'm waiting now for the fifteenth because I have this this full novel is out to two other publishers on spec. But it was interesting because when I got the notice that they were seriously considering this, they said, in the meantime, if it's accepted elsewhere, please let us know. So they understand that you're not waiting around for them with your breath held. Hmm. Well, that's probably a wise thing to do. Um, Okay, but when you, so you, you've got the book, it's edited and everything. Have you ever been in a situation where someone's edited your work and basically torn it to shreds? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking, because generally I, I, you know, I go the, the road where, the kinder road for many years now. Uh, but several years back, I took um, that first novel I was talking about, the guy who couldn't see his, his daughter, 
um, was it, 10 pages? Anyway, it was a master class with Barbara Kyle. And um, it was one of those situations where you submit your work to all of the 10 participants and then everybody gets to comment on your work. Mm-hmm. And But these were people I didn't know. And the men, oh my God, they were brutal. And uh, like really brutal. And uh, I was just sitting there going, wow, this is really awful. I hate this. But then you have a private consultation with Barbara. And she said, don't listen to those guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it and must be really was, hard, especially when you've um, you've finished. You've you've put a lot of work. How long did it take, beginning to end, to do that book, that novel? The one that's out on submission is yes. what you're talking about. Yep. That book, that one wasn't too too long. That was probably, yeah, that was probably two to three, three years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. So you've put three years of work and effort into this book. You must feel by the end of the book, like you know those characters intimately. They live in your head for two or three years. Mm -hmm. And then you you put it out there into the world. Isn't that a scary kind of a feeling? I mean, okay, you're excited, right? You're excited because the book is finished and la la la, you really like it. And then someone says, nah, not really interested. It's got to be such, it's so brave, I think, to put it out there. And what does it do to you when you get that, that yeah. response? And even when it's fiction, you, you're really putting yourself on the page. You know, you're, mm-hmm. you, like Pat Schneider says, you're a brave person just to, just to, to write it down. It, you know? um, yeah, it, it, it's a horrible feeling. Um, and, and, and it's really hard not to feel decimated and not to feel that, you know, even though everybody says, oh, no, everybody gets rejections, you still feel like, yeah, but but this is me. This is my baby. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, you get a little harder over time, a little more toughened, I should say, rather than harder. Um, so you just keep sending it out. Just don't think about it. Just send it out. So I have things on submission. I've got short pieces. I've got poems. I've got, and, you know, periodically... You know, thank you for you know our chance to read it. Unfortunately, I get those all the time, and I just okay, yeah, off you go. <laughs> and next. it is it is probably true. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we're not looking for this novel at this time, and they they, I don't know. It's like a quota system, right? There's only so much that they put out every year about yeah, exactly, a specific topic exactly. or on a specific genre, and it's the same in the music industry. I remember talking to a producer who was telling me about my daughter and her singing. She's an opera singer, um, but at the time he said, "So this is what I think she needs to do. This is where I think you need to go." And all of this is, of course, someone's opinion is very valid, and you you take it all in. And then he looked at her and he said, but remember, I'm the guy who turned Beyonce down. Oh, wow. So, wow. You sit back and think, holy moly. And there are publishers who turn down J.K. Rawlings and Harry Potter, right? And there are publishers who turn down Stephen King a million times. He talks about the fact that he was on his last 25 cents, literally, to to make the phone call to get what he was sure was going to be another rejection, only to find out that they had accepted his book. But he was, they were eating you know, bread and peanut butter sandwiches at that time. It was really getting desperate. Yeah, these are the stories you, that, <laughs> yeah, that you, I, I, you all don't the time know, to buoy you up. <laughs> yeah, you don't know if that's really true or not, but in some cases it definitely is. And there are publishers out there who think, Oh, rats. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have turned down that book. So I, I can see how for you would, or for any author, when you've you finished your book and you send it out there, it's nerve wracking, but it's also, I guess, just a great feeling to have it done and, and let it grow wings and fly and be free. Yeah. I, I just wanted to comment on something that you said earlier about how, how alive the characters in the story is. It, it's it's real like it happened yeah <laughs> in, in in the author's mind and uh, um, a month or so ago I was driving through a part of Barry and I got this well of emotion and it was it, actually I've never lived in Barry but this was the street that I had imagined my character lived on mm. 
I wow. felt like I was visiting an old friend. And I'm like, Tupam, it's not real. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Only now it did because you actually found it in real life. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. See, you know, no, you can't go knock on her door because she's not there. <laughs> So do you find yourself like driving down the road thinking of your characters when you're writing a novel? Oh, always, yeah. 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 You you're and, and, yeah. having dinner with them sometimes? <laughs> What's that? You're having dinner with them at the table sometimes? <laughs> not quite. I'm not quite that loony, but no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think we're at the point now where we've talked about your novel a lot, and I'd like to give the listeners a little taste of what it's actually like. Do you mind reading some of it for us? No, I'd love to. Take it away? Yes, take it away. (laughs) Okay. Okay, so the novel is called What the Living Do, and this is the first chapter. A turkey vulture drops a rope of intestine and lifts the way into a hard blue sky. The dog at the roadside is some kind of mixed breed with a delicate snout and brindled coat. Mel eases the truck to a stop, and I clamp on my hard hat. Overhead, the big bird carves a dark circle while Mel drags the shovel out of the truck bed. Even though I know the dog is dead, I squat to touch it, just in case. But its jaw gapes, its legs are stiff as branches, its milky eyes open. Michelangelo peels the skins of cadavers. He was searching for a deeper mystery than how muscle attaches the bone. I'm searching for something more, too, not just a tag to name the owner of the dog. In the dead, Michelangelo found the underpinnings for his art. I haven't yet been able to name what it is I find in these still creatures. There's no tag on this dog. It's scrawny. I touch a rib bone that pokes through the skin like a tire spoke. Was he abandoned, or did he simply leave? the scent of wild things pulling him from the safety of home. Mel drives a boot into the shovel's edge and begins to dig, the crunch of hard-packed summer dirt, the scent of forgotten things deep in the earth, the steady rasping of Mel's breathing. We didn't bury my sister Goldie or my father. After the fire, they brought two clay urns to the edge of the Kootenai River. The wind picked up the ash and bits of bone, casting them in a wide arc over the cold river. Before they settled into the water, a gust of wind caught a handful of ash and flung it into my mouth. When we slide the dog into the hole, its skull bone shows white through the cracked bowl of its head. This doesn't cause me to gag the way it used to. I still smell smoke, though, whenever the dull moon of an eye lies exposed like this. Mel labors onto one knee and opens his fist, letting a confetti of tobacco drift over the small corpse. I keep my eyes on the still form while Mel lifts his head to intone a prayer. I hear Nimush and Miigwech, the words for dog and thank you. The first roadkill I buried was a fox. Nothing about it had seemed dead that cool spring morning. It was as if the fox had simply lain down to rest in the middle of the second line, the white tip of its tail curled over the sun flare of its body. I'd sensed Mel's eyes on me, even though he faced straight ahead. I'd removed my gla- gloves in search of a pulse and found a hardness that made me rock back on my heels. Wagoosh, Mel had said. The fox had smelled of juniper and cedar. Turning my head away so Mel couldn't see my face, I'd heard the shovels metal on metal across the truck side. It was the prayer that undid me, the soft syllables like a lullaby. Once we were back in the truck, Mel had touched a finger to the box of tissues tucked into the console and started the engine. When he turned to the left to check for traffic, I'd yanked one from the box and made as if checking traffic from the right. From the right. Mel is the only one I ever want to ride with, the only one who's never made lame lunges to grab my ass on the pretense of helping me into the cab, and the only one who doesn't bitch, not about the weather, the road conditions, or his wife, and not even about the cutbacks that have forced us to drive the snowplows without a wingman. After we've mounted the earth and tamped it down over the young dog, I toss the shovel into the truck bed and step up into the cab. Mel has the truck in gear. Teach me how to pray, Mel, I say. Without turning his head, Mel lifts a gray eyebrow. You pray to real things, like animals. I need you to teach me. His answer comes like it always does after a long pause. Don't pray to animals. Pray for them. Now he turns a half turn, almost facing me, to give thanks. 
I want some of what he has, that steady sweeping gaze over the land, the ease with which he dangles his fingers through the steering wheel, the slow nod when one of the good old boys at the yard calls him cheese. Is that what makes you peaceful? Peaceful, he says, as if trying out the word. Yeah, I say. How does it start? Sounds like bonjour. Bonjour, he corrects. We say bonjour, que j'aime means hello, creator. The other things you say, after that. Mel nods, returns his gaze to the road. Mishkiki nini dijnikaz is how I start. I try out the words, but they feel like pebbles in my mouth. And it looks like Mel is trying not to smile. What? You said, my name is Strong Earth Man. Well, I like that. How do you say my name is Strong Earth Woman? The smile that was forming vanishes. These are the times when I feel I've stepped over some sacred invisible boundary. It's in the density of this quiet, as if all the light has been sucked into a vacuum. What did I say? I lean the side of my head into the window and see through the outside mirror that we've done a fine job. Not even a ripple in the gravel remains to mark the spot where the dog is buried. In the beginning, I'd try to insist we find the owners, but if the animals aren't close to a house, the mandate is simply to bury them. No time to go calling door to door. Now, what should I say? Easing his foot from the pedal, Mel turns the truck back onto the road. Just your name. Can't I have a cool name, too? We're on the road heading south, on the lookout for roadkill, bent signs, and potholes. Sun comes hot and thick through the heavy leaves of maple, oak, and poplar. When Mel doesn't answer, I turn to look full at him. Mel? How do I get a name like that? His eyelids lift, and he seems to take some effort for him to focus. He blinks. The fingers dangling from the top of the steering wheel tap at air. I screw things up. The long silence makes that clear. I want to apologize, but I'm not exactly sure for what. Okay, so no special name. Okay, so how do I say it with the name I've got? The hard line of Mel's jaw softens. You say your name, then Dijnikaz. The sharp sound of my own name is jarring when followed by the warmth of the Ojibwe syllables. I want a name that's tough and wild like Cougar Woman, but given that the man I live with is that much younger than I am, it might not be the best choice. And given that my request Mel's inscrutable silence, I decide not to push it. After a second attempt at Brett Mishnikov, I say, what do you say next? From under his eyelids, Mel watches ahead through the sun-stained windshield. I say, oh, I say, Rama Dunjaba, Wawaskeshi Dodum. This invocation flows like a song, warms me right into my belly, where it's been cold for some time. Does that mean I'm from Rama? Mel nods. And the rest? My clan. You have a clan? What kind of clan? Dear. On the far side of the road, guard posts list toward the ditch, their guide wires stretched tight. There it is, I say, pointing. I don't have a clan, I say, as Mel swings the truck around in a smooth view. So what would come next for me? Just where you're from, Dendunjaba. Where I'm from? Where your heart is, Mel says. But they're not the same place, I say. For the rest of the afternoon, Mel and I are mostly silent. That's what I like about him. Once when I asked him why he never asked questions, he told me if a person wanted to tell a thing, they would. When I said that inquiring after the well-being of people you care about was supposed to be the polite thing to do, he just shook his head. I push on my sunglasses to combat the glare that blazes through the pocked windshield and content myself with watching for potholes to fill and signs to straighten. I read somewhere that it's going to be a mild winter, I say. Mel glances out the window. When he doesn't comment, I say, Late start, that would be good. We have the windows open. Neither of us likes air conditioning, even when it's this hot. A few strands of hair have broken loose from my braid and whip across my mouth. I don't want to think about winter, but when I close my eyes, I see snow, ice, sand, and brine. A dark, empty road and an almost empty hopper. Alone at three in the morning, stuffed in my padded oak coveralls, the drone of engine, the steady scrape of blade lights. In my rear view, overhead, ahead, blue, red, white, and coming down that hill on glare ice. At the low dip, a little blue car revolved like something at a fall fair. I flip open my eyes and resolve anew my pledge to leave before winter sets in. I'm used to waiting for Mel to answer. 
When we first started riding together, I'd fill in the quiet by answering for him or asking more questions. Because it finally registered that when I did that, he never actually answered, I trained myself to wait. Now we like the waiting. It's as if the world stops just then and my mind goes still, too. A slow smile forms on his face. Once, Webb, my older brother, told me we were in for a cold winter. He said you could tell because the caterpillars had thick coats. Mel scratches the sparse stubble on his chin. His smile fades. I laughed. I thought he was joking. He wasn't? That's how you can tell? Only Mel's eyes moved to take a quick look at me. Maybe, he says, clicking on the turn signal and spinning the wheel to the right. How did the caterpillars look this year? His smile is a smaller version of the one a moment before. It's still hot. Maybe check in September. Mel and I replaced three road signs perforated with bullet holes, cold patch half a dozen potholes, remove a fallen ash off a county road, and pull a mattress from a ditch. No more dead things today. We'll switch there. Wow. That was absolutely lovely. It was captivating and intriguing. I can't wait to read the book. Somebody's <laughs> got to publish it because I want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm an old fashioned book person. Even if I listen to a book on talking books, I go out and buy the hard copy and put it oh. on my shelf. And even if I don't ever read it again, um, cover to cover, I'll pick it up and refresh my memory as to why it's on my shelf and think, ah, oh, I love that book and put it back <laughs> on my shelf. <laughs> kind of makes me a nostalgic nut, doesn't it? (laughs) I like paper books, too. So, Deepam, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for for telling us a bit about the journey of this book. I can't wait to see it in print. I think it's going to be wonderful. I hope someone picks it up. I know they will. In my heart, I have a feeling that this will be a published book. Are you working on a new one, too? Have you got another new book in the yeah, works? Yeah, I'm working on that one I was telling you about, this kind of rework of the the woman that showed up in the story I started writing 11 years ago. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So that one's not quite done yet? No, it's not. I think you've heard some pieces of it in the, in our workshops together. Yeah, I have, definitely. Yeah, and I plan to, when I'm taking a retreat to Quebec and... Um, in October. Actually, I realized that the the retreat goes from the 14th to 17th of October, and uh, it's the 15th that the acquisitions meeting is happening. So I'm probably going to find out in the middle of my retreat. <laughs> oh, that's fine, though. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, we can celebrate. I'll have people to celebrate with. Yes. Oh, I hope it goes well. Yeah. It will. Thank you. So, uh, do you have any words of encouragement to young authors and writers or people who, through the COVID um, months, have decided to start writing their first novel? Any words of encouragement for them? Yeah, just write write what comes up. And also, Barbara Turner Vesalago has five wonderful precepts, and one of them is write what you don't want to write. Write your word. You know, go where the energy is. So just begin to write, write whatever you can write. I don't know what to write. (laughs) And just keep that pen moving until you find that little gem, that little piece of fire that that calls to you. And if you find yourself resisting, write it anyway. Just go in. It's going to be gold. Do you recommend that people read their stuff aloud to friends and family? No. (laughs) Thank God you said that. (laughs) If you no. said yes, I was going to start to cry. No, okay. No, do not. Do <laughs> not. Absolutely do not. Read to your writer friends who are who understand the process and who will give you positive feedback um, because we are so vulnerable. When you write, you are putting yourself on the page and especially in the beginning. Oh my God, do not, do not, do not. They, if people don't understand the process, they won't understand what they're hearing. But other writers who, who are in the process and who understand, you know, the challenges and, uh, then again, the vulnerability of writing, even if it's fiction, you, you just, it's so easy to get shut down. It, yes. it happens in a heartbeat. Yes, it does. Do not read. Do not read to your partner. Do not read to your best friend unless you or he is a writer. Yeah. One of, one of my writers that writes with me, she said, you know, she just gave it to her girlfriend and her girlfriend said, I have no, I don't understand this. I don't know what is, I don't understand this. What's this about? And 
I mean, that, that just, you know, it could dead in the water. Yeah. You're know, like, oh, oh, okay, it's crap then, and you just throw it in the garbage. And that is um, not a good idea because everything, and you know it too, no matter how crappy that, you know, shitty first draft is, there's always gold in it. There's always something that yeah. works. Yeah. And when you pull those threads out, the ones that work, the pieces that are strong, the images, the that are strong then you've got then you've got something to work with and you can't expect it to land on the page fully formed you just can't right well on those words of encouragement i would like to say that uh i've really enjoyed speaking with you this morning thank you so much for sharing your adventure with us and uh, it's an ongoing adventure of writing and publishing and being brave and vulnerable and putting your wonderful pieces of of writing and your works out into the world and i hope you'll be able to share them with the entire world very very soon thank you and thank you for your great questions well, nice to work with you. It's kind of what I do here. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. Our guest this morning is Susan Deepam Wads. And what is the title of your book? What the Living Do. What the Living Do. And we've been speaking about that this morning. So I hope everybody has a terrific day. Enjoy yourself. Be kind to one another. And we will catch you again next time on Fresh Waves.